Thanks for listening to the Media People Podcast, lively and insightful chats with the people who power the media industry. I'm your host, Victor Genova. For more episodes, you can go to mediapeople.ca or subscribe wherever you get podcasts, including youtube.com slash at media people podcast. Views expressed by participants are personal. What was your Achilles heel in school? Maybe it was essays, presentations, or tests. I was never strong at exams, so I had to put the effort into my coursework to salvage a decent grade. But this is where universal design for learning comes in. The goal of UDL is to provide students with the options to learn for themselves in ways that make sense to them. At the forefront of bringing UDL to the classroom is today's guest, Danny Smith. Danny is a professor at George Brown College, educating students in the college's marketing and advertising program. But this Ottawa area native almost missed his calling to teach. When the concurrent education program at Trent University passed on Danny's application, he chose to study mass communications at Carleton University. This led to a career in marketing, which led to a career in education administration, which would eventually pave the way for Danny's teaching career. Danny Smith stops by to chat about growing up in Nepean, Ontario, a marketing career that includes the sales and merchandise group in Capital C, and how he's revolutionizing the classroom experience with universal design for learning. As a professor at George Brown, I teach and lead up to four classes or four courses a semester. As a course lead, I'm responsible for designing all of the curriculum, the content, the assessments, and the activities. And then sometimes those are, well, they're always passed on to part-time teachers as well, who can then modify the contents. But basically, I'm responsible for the original structure of each of the four courses that I lead. Um, in a given year, I will participate and contribute to a variety of initiatives and or try to participate in other ways outside the classroom. So for example, I'll do a session of some sort with the Student Marketing Association or I'll try to meet up with some industry folks um, and also do some extra research on industry uh, best practices and how they're changing and evolving. And obviously right now that's super important with AI. And I'm also a universal design for learning coach and consultant. And universal design for learning is a curriculum design framework that seeks to make the classroom way more inclusive by removing learning barriers. What we want to do is enable students to really learn for themselves in the ways that make sense to them. So for example, you might have been in a course where you were told you must take a written exam. Well, in the courses that I lead and design, I will provide students with options to say, look, if you are able to write really well and communicate really well through a written exam, you can do that, or you can take an oral exam. Or I'll say, you can do a live presentation or you can do a recorded presentation. So what I'm trying to do is help students figure out what their strengths are and then be able to communicate their learning in the best way possible. It's really what I wanna know at the end of the course is, do they have the learning? And so I coach internally at George Brown with that. And I also speak at a variety of other institutions, colleges, universities, uh, locally and internationally to try to help change uh, higher ed to a more inclusive learning environment. Danny, thanks for stopping by today. I'm really looking forward to our chat, but let's go back to the beginning. Where are you from? I'm from Ottawa. Canada's capital. So what was like life like growing up in the capital? Ottawa is a great city. It has everything you need. It's really clean, lots of bike trails, which my family availed of every weekend. Um, I lived in the outskirts of Ottawa. I lived in downtown Ottawa. And yeah, I had a great time. I was involved in like theater sports, skiing uh, on the Quebec side of things. I worked at some city run day camps for several years. It was great. I had a, a wonderful time growing up. And so, yeah, a lot of people forget that Ottawa is right on the border between Ontario and Quebec. So you, for recreational purposes or anything else, you crossed the border quite a bit, it sounds like. Because you're a skier, you said? Yes, uh, skied at a variety of hills on the French side. I even worked on the French side for a while um, when I was a Mountain Dew dude. <laughs> when I was a Mountain Dew dude, a Mug Bug Posse member. Sorry, sorry, hold on. Hold on. What, what's, a, what's a Mountain Dew dude? You got to tell me that. <laughs> what's a Mountain Dew dude? A Mountain Dew dude was the first marketing job I ever 
uh, landed and it was for sales and merchandising group uh, when I was in university. And myself and my workmate, uh, we were given a Ford Escape. No, not a Ford Escape. If it's a but smaller escape. SUV, it's the, it's the Escape, yeah. The Escape. Okay, so Ford Escape and then the Duhall, which is just a, an outfitted U-Haul, but they call it the Duhall. And we would drive all throughout Ottawa, Nepean, actually all the way to Belleville. And then we would cross the river and go to Elmer, Gatineau, Hall, Boucherville. And we would sample Mountain Dew. We would sell it at the major grocery stores. And we would also set up a huge jousting ring where people would joust and fall off and win prizes and things like that. So yeah, I worked on both sides of the water uh, for a few years, probably around three years. And you were also quite an artistic student, weren't you? You were in dance, you were in acting, you were in the band as well. What, what did you play in band? Let's start with that, because I was also in band. Oh, were you? Okay. Yep. Um, I played the uh, alto saxophone. I was alto also saxophone, okay. Yeah, I was also band president. Try to do some leadership positions there. I was heavily involved in improv up until maybe grade 12. And you put all uh, these things together and it sounds like you had a thing for music theater. Would that be the right thing to say? Or just uh, I keep wish. The theater and music? Oh my separate? gosh. <laughs> if I could sing or if I had a voice that would lend itself to singing, I would totally have been in musical theater. I love it. Um, I love musical theater and always have, but never performed. And you were also a rugby player and a rower. Yes. <laughs> so my parents were really big on trying a lot of things. You didn't have to stick with it. It was okay to quit, but you had to give things a try. So for several summers, I took up rowing and I did some uh, single kayaking, tandem kayaking. I did some war canoe. Um, so I did that for several summers. And then I think in grade seven, I took up rugby because we had an exchange program in my school where we had some students from France come in and we were billeted kind of a, a billeted arrangement. And so I took up rugby and I played that for, I think, three or four years up until maybe grade 10. And then I broke my nose in the game. And I was like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> so yeah. I've heard that's a rite of passage for all rugby players. Like there's two types of rugby players, those who have broken their nose and those who yes. will, those who are yet to have broken their nose playing. It's so easy, right? It is funny because I had Kleenex in my pockets for some reason. So I just stuffed the Kleenex up my nose, played the rest of the game. And then my older brother took me to uh, the Queensway Carlton Hospital in Ottawa. And they're like, yeah, you broke your nose. Can't do anything about it. But that was my, my last game. I was like, no need to injure myself for a sport. Nowadays, because we're so obsessed with cleanliness, if anyone yeah. starts to bleed, you're off the pitch immediately. It's not like patch yourself up and get back out there with the team. It's like <laughs> quarantine, put them off to the side, dose them in, I don't know, rubbing alcohol, yes. <laughs> get them antibiotics. So, but uh, zero, let's, tolerance. zero tolerance for that. But let's go yeah. into your first job. So this is a bit of a tongue twister for me. The Naughty Knoll Day Camp, or we'll call it KKC. Yeah. How did yeah. that, tell us a little bit about that first job. How did you how did you come about it? And how did that kind of set yourself up for what you wanted to do with the rest of your life? Cause I'm looking at this and it's like, yeah, he's kind of laying the groundwork for his future career. Oh yeah. 100%. So not an old day camp. It's a long running day camp in the PN. Uh, so just outside of Ottawa. And I was like a leader in training there in LIT or a counselor in training there for a few years. And then I finally got full time, a uh, full time role there. And it was it was my jam. You know, you could be really creative, lots of energy, have a lot of fun with kids. I still love hanging out with kids. Um, my son, I have a son who's nine years old, and we play all the time. Uh, and I organize some events for our community. Anyway, I, I digress. Um, the thing that sort of catapulted me into marketing was the day that the Hubba Bubba Chewing Gum Company came to our camp. So they set up this huge dome and we had, uh, you could sample, I think two different varieties of bubble gum. And then we had a bubble blowing contest and, you know, they came with their marked vehicle and the whole promotional setup. And I was like, Whoa, what is that job? Like literally all they have to do is drive around and give out gum and have fun with kids all day. 
it's like, I can do that and I want to do that. And so really the, my last year of being a camp counselor, that's when I saw the Hubba Bubba crew. And then by the following year, that's when I uh, started my new summer job, uh, PATH with Sales and Merchandise Group. And you stayed in Ottawa for university. So what brought you to Carleton University and why study mass communications? Carleton was my second option. And my first option was I wanted to go to Trent, Trent University in Peterborough for their concurrent ed program. I had always wanted to be a teacher. Always, always, always. And as far as I can go back in my memory, I always wanted to be a teacher. And I applied to the Con Ed program there and I didn't get in. Hold on, I got to yeah. pause you there for that. Can we talk about how cutthroat it is to get into concurrent ed programs and not even <laughs> to get into them, but to stay into yes. them as well? Because they had one at Brock yeah. University. And I know where, where I attended university and I know that it was, like I said, very difficult to get into. And you'd yes. start to see people fall out of it after second year. And it's not like they were getting bad grades. They just weren't the grades they needed to continue in the program. And also to concurrent ed for people who are unfamiliar with it, because they're probably thinking what, like, it's not as explanatory as like chemistry or biology. What is yes. a concurrent education program for our listeners? And what so, are the benefits to being in that program? Concurrent education degree means you're getting your undergrad degree and your bachelor of education degree at the same time versus consecutively. Well, it's weird. It's if I if I've got this right, you'll have like a separate major and then you have to reapply to get into teacher's college after your fourth year. So you're kind of holding your breath going, did I get this degree? Will I get into teacher's college? And there are a lot of people that don't get into teacher's college. And that was the plan if they're at a university that doesn't have a con ed program. Yeah, so for me, it's, you know, hedge your bets, bets, hedge your bets, and, you know, try to get everything done as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And so Con Ed made a whole lot of sense to me. And uh, yeah, I agree. I didn't want to risk, you know, getting my undergrad and then applying to, uh, to complete an education degree and then not get into that program. So, because then I would really be lost. I think if I were to go back in my mind, I would have been apprehensive about going that route so because I didn't get in I was like okay well what's my second choice and I knew I had really uh, I knew I, I was strong at communicating I was strong with leadership um, my mind was sort of tweaked with this hubba bubba crew and so I said well why not go into mass calm I didn't want to like to focus on business business doesn't really excite me um, but the communication piece did. And mass communications at Carleton had a really good reputation because of the journalism school. So I figured, okay, I'm interested in the topic. It's got a great reputation. It still allows me to stay home because I'm also very frugal. I didn't want to spend money or my parents' money uh, setting me away if it wasn't something that I was 100% passionate about. That didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, and I loved Ottawa, so I had no problem staying there. Was it the type of program where they're overly critical of mass media and everything like that. You know, like we're, we're they yes. dissect and pick it apart six ways to Sunday. And you're just like, Oh, I used to enjoy that program, but I guess I don't anymore. Or I thought that ad was clever, but it doesn't seem like it is. Yes. It's, it's more the study of the detrimental effects of advertising, or at least that's, that was my main takeaway from the program. And which same I was, with what I study too. Yeah. Like what are the yeah. underlying effects? What are they really saying? And yeah, what are they doing? So making it, you know, you're, you're practicing your critical thinking all the time, right? Why are they doing this? Why are they not doing that? Um, are they being the brands? And I thought that set me up well to move into the industry. Now I know way more about my marketing because I teach it, but uh, and I wish I would have had this knowledge going into, let's say my first real account management job. But uh, I think mass communication set me up well, just, to get an understanding of what's going on, where there are some of its components and how to think critically about the work that you're doing. Okay, so let's talk about the marketing job you had in university. We already spoke about it a little bit when you were one of yeah. the, was it the Mountain Dew dudes? That's a yes. nice tongue twister. <laughs> so that was with the sales and merchandising group. How did that come about? Like you had your moment when you're like, I'm getting my, I'm getting my branded SUV and I'm going on the road yeah. with colleagues. Like how did you land that opening? First thing that sales and merchandising group ever sent me or SNMG was a notice to say that I didn't get the job. And I was totally bummed. I didn't get the, the Mountain Dew job. And a day after they phoned me and they said that I got it. 
I was like, okay, <laughs> this is quite the roller coaster, but little did I know that they were sort of setting me up for the industry, which is always changing and evolving. Yes. Um, so I got that job and it was a 16 week contract again with vehicle and the whole uh, experience. And we did really, really well. The person that I worked with and I sold, I think the most Mountain Dew across the country, we had outstanding results. And I in turn received a little bit of a scholarship from SNMG. So I was like, wow, what a turn of events. At first, I was sort of rejected by them, but by the end, I was receiving a scholarship. So I said, okay, things are good. This is a fun industry. And did I ever work? I never saw my friends the whole summer. And it's because I was driving around. We were uh, staying in hotels, depending on where we were. We were always eating out. Um, I was, had an opportunity to record radio spots on the local radio station saying, you know, where to find the doo dudes. And so that was really cool being in the studio there and learning some of the tricks of the trade. So like, it, it just brought me, uh, it opened my eyes to lots of different components of marketing and advertising. And I was like, oh, I want more of this. So I was really eager to get my next contract. And I stuck with SNMG for about three years, I want to say, because after that, at one point, I was a Kokanee Mountain Patroller, so the Kokanee the beer. Um, I managed and coordinated the Pepsi Taste Tour, which is, you know, if you remember that old taste challenge where you had to pick, excuse me, where you had to pick the one that has uh, the best taste. Oh, yeah. And I was Coke. usually one of those guys trying to differentiate it from Coke. And they were like, no, that's yeah. not the question we're asking. You're, you're that's answering right. the question. That's right. I'd, be like, I'd be like, that's Coke. And they're like, no, no, no. Which one tastes better? Yeah, which one tastes better? We don't care which one is which. Which one do you like best? Have you ever heard um, the science behind why they did that? Yeah. They had some sort of research that showed that people are more likely to enjoy, like if you're coming in cold, like yeah. like it's your first, your first, not your first time drinking cold, but your first time for that day or that moment. If you give someone a Pepsi and a Coke and just a sip of each, they're more likely to pick the Pepsi. But apparently, if you're doing like a full can test, they're more likely yeah. to pick the Coke because the oh, Pepsi really? is on the sweeter <laughs> side. So they totally took that research and said, that's all we need to do is just give out Costco sized samples, record it and make media out of it. It was so much fun. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I just think of it getting into concerts and running concerts and getting backstage all with the Pepsi taste tour. That was an awesome campaign and really sort of sealed the deal for me wanting to continue in marketing as soon as I graduated from Carleton. So that's funny because you didn't care about the business side of mass communications very much, but you found yourself in a job that put you into the business side of things. And it seems like you discovered yeah. a passion you didn't, you didn't realize you had for that side of the business. What I didn't know is how exciting it was going to be. And I, the amount of work never deterred me. I enjoyed the work and it was never the same day twice. And there's always challenges to overcome, especially with event marketing. Um, it, it's just, yeah, it, it sort of opened my eyes to everything, like I said. Do you think you would have had a different perspective or a different attitude towards marketing if that first job in university had been in a cubicle somewhere, maybe wearing a shirt and tie, still doing marketing, but you were dealing with spreadsheets, some of the stuff that's not as sexy to a, a 19 or a 20 year old as say getting your old your own Ford Escape and sampling Mountain Dew and Pepsi at concerts? Oh, yeah, I think I would have bailed really soon. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people would have as well. Because it's it's it wasn't tapping into sort of my natural abilities or talents, you know, getting people fired up, communicating on the fly with people that I've never met before. Like I'll have a conversation with anybody uh, pretty much anywhere. And, you know, I have a lot of energy. That's what even my students today will say. You're really, really passionate. You're passionate about the things you talk about. You bring a lot of energy to the classroom. And that's always been the case. So I think the part of the work that I dislike the most is making spreadsheets. It's the, you know, back then, I guess, maybe writing PowerPoints that were too long. Um, some of that slow stuff certainly doesn't give me energy. And I think what, what students and what professionals need to, to tap into is what are the things that give you energy? And I wish that was told to me sooner. 
I only learned that really once I started working at the college was find those things that give you energy. And I was like, oh yeah, like this is the path I need to go on from, from that point. And I wish I would have learned that a little bit sooner. What was your first job after university? I left university and I walked into an account coordinator role at OSL, which is Otis Sauter, Leger and Partners. They're out by the airport. And I worked on a variety of clients, Red Rose, Lint, uh, Captain Morgan's Parfait Rum, Bear, Tropicana, a whole host of different brands. Um, and I managed sort of the day-to-day kind of things. You know, as account coordinator, you're running around. You're At that point, I would drive, if you can remember this, I would drive um, like banner ads to a publisher. So like to transcontinental publishing or whatever. So I'd oh, get, like, yep. take yeah, the you DVD, could... drive it over, see if they could open it. Oh, they couldn't open it. Okay. I'll drive back to the office, get another one, drive it. Oh my gosh. Like what we used to do just to make things work. When I was at CBC, we were kind of still 50, 50 between people submitting their creative electronically versus physically. And Every once in a while, um, UPS or FedEx would show up with a beta tape of the final version of an ad that had to go live in like six to eight hours. It was going into a hockey game. So, no, I know exactly uh, what we went through back then when we had to when we had to get things into people's hands physically. Yes. And and even I went on my first printing press tour. With OSL and I was fascinated by how the different presses worked and how they selected different substrates and, you know, a spot gloss and it ended up oh, so interesting. And it, it made me really appreciate what goes into the work because somebody has to think about every single thing. Same person doesn't have to think about all those things, but somebody's putting thought into every step along the way. So it was really interesting to me reading that book, you might recall it, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. You know, it was really big for a little period of time. We're like, yeah, don't sweat the small stuff. I'm like, no, in this business, you have to sweat the small stuff. Details matter. Yeah, details matter. And what was your rationale or your thinking behind every decision that was made? And slow down to look into it. I have those spirited debates with every company I've worked at where I'm on the sales side of the business and something that I strive to do is not have to say or reduce the number of times I have to say to a a prospect or a client, let me get back to you. So I'm always out and there. People are like, they're not going to ask that. And sure enough, they do ask that question. So it's those little details that you do have to button down. But let me ask you about this move to, to uh, OSL, because this was your first time living in Toronto. Yes. So how did you find the job and what made you want to relocate to Toronto? Oh, how did I find a job? I tell my students this all the time. Um, I made myself a little campaign. So I went to a marketing mag, a marketing magazine used to have this book that listed all of the agencies. And I grabbed, I think, 10 different agency names that for no, <laughs> for no other reason, I just like their name. And I was like, okay, this side, like this one sounds sort of cool. They have around 50 employees. Great. I knew I wanted a smaller shop uh, because I like a, a tight knit kind of organization. And I already learned that. And I basically sent them all oh, eight and a half by 11 printed in color saying, hey, I'm graduating soon. These are the brands that I've already worked for through SNMG. And two weeks after I mailed them that, I mailed them the same 8 and by 11, but with my resume. And then two weeks later after that, I reached out for informational interviews. And I landed three out of 10. And the first one I met with was Oda Sauter. And they offered me a job by the time I left. And I was supposed to go on a, on a road trip with my buddy. And I phoned him up and I said, I'm sorry, but... I just got a job in Toronto and it's for an agency that I'm curious about. And so I had to bail on my buddy. Uh, He was fine. He went (laughs) somewhere else and I started and I found a place uh, within a few weeks 
And my dad and I moved all my stuff from Ottawa in a big U-Haul. He dropped me off, set up shop. And I borrowed my stepmother's car. My dad paid for my car insurance because I wasn't going to be making a, enough just yet. And I started my career. So it was, it was pretty exciting. And it just so happened that one of my closest high school friends, I didn't know this, but she rented a place just down the street from me. And we hadn't talked over the month that all of this stuff was going on. And it just so happened she was there. And we're like, oh, great. I know I already have at least one friend in the city. Tell us about your move to Capital C and what did your role as account supervisor entail? Okay, so I was at Capital C twice. And so uh, I'll sort of weave a story about Newfoundland and Labrador in there too. So I wanted to leave OSL for no other reason that I didn't want to commute anymore. So I said to myself, I need a place downtown because I was sort of living just, just outside of downtown. I want a place downtown Toronto and I want to work downtown Toronto somewhere where I can walk to. And I had heard that Capital C had just won the FM account and uh, they were doing some good things. And I reached out, I gave them a call and said, hey, you know, I heard you won this account. I'm looking for a move, can I come over? And I met with the leaders there, Tony Chapman, uh, Tom Clune, and shortly thereafter, I was offered a position to manage the FM account. I was on the, the food side of things and pet food. So Uncle Ben's is theirs, Whiskas, Pedigree Dog Food. Um, so I managed the, again, the day-to-day -day, uh, projects, you know, making sure things are briefed in, projects are executed, um, all that kind of stuff. And within working there for two years, um, I decided to move to Newfoundland. And it was for love. And uh, so I moved out to Newfoundland and I worked for two pure advertising agencies there. And the, the first agency that I worked at there was Bristol. They're not, no longer in business, but they had offices in Halifax, St. John, New Brunswick, uh, Moncton. And so I booted around a lot throughout the Atlantic provinces. And then I, left there and I moved to Target, a really small little agency. And what was wonderful about both of those agencies as a manager is I was able to work on a Newfoundland and Labrador tourism campaigns. And you might recall them, like the, the ads are, they're stories, not about all the things you can do at the destination, but the stories get to the heart of the place and the soul of Newfoundland Labrador. And so I was really, really fortunate to work on that account at both agencies. And then the love that I chased ended and I returned to Toronto and came back to Capital C as account supervisor on the PepsiCo business, working on, oh my gosh, everything, Tropicana, Pepsi, uh, Amp, their Lay's, um, Nuts, True North Nuts, a whole variety of, of different products. And I worked uh, with those folks for around three years at that point. Your time in Newfoundland and Labrador, though, how did working at those agencies differ from doing, say, a similar job in Toronto? It was really special. I remember walking into the lunchroom at Bristol the first day I was working there and the whole place just stopped working and everybody congregated around the lunch table and we all had lunch together I was taken aback I was like I've seen people you know just sort of like say you know in the, in the halls of the other agencies oh let's just grab something to eat you know we'll sit or whatever but to have pretty much everybody stop and eat together and have that critical downtime, relationship building time, community building time. That was, that was unique to there. I'd never seen that before. Um, and, and so faithfully done. So it wasn't just like once a month or once a week, it was every day. And so I think that taught me a lot about what I value. So small, 
small agencies, intimate teams that really get to know each other. And Oda Sauter Leger was that for sure for me, but they had a whole Montreal office that I never really knew. Um, Capital C was pretty small the first time I got there. And so I grew with it over two years. Um, but that was really unique to the Newfoundland Labrador experience. And it opened my eyes to use that phrase again, it opened my eyes to the Atlantic provinces. You know, I'm coming from Ottawa and I knew of the East Coast, but I never spent a lot of time growing up in the East Coast. So that was really special to be able to work in multiple offices, meet a lot of people, learn about the different cultures um, in those areas and to give back to them as well. I thought that was really, that was really cool. So what brought you to area communications and what did your role as a senior manager entail there? So I was at area for just under a year. I reported to a director and senior director there and I worked exclusively on core products working on promotions, e-newsletter campaigns, photography. And at one point, I guess at the end of our year together, I was let go uh, along with my director on the same day. And that was honestly the best thing that has ever happened to me. Um, I was shaken for about, I'm gonna say a few minutes. And then I was like, okay, I'm just gonna get on my bike and ride home. Like it wasn't, didn't really throw me off. What I did for myself though, was I made a plan. I said, look, I'm going to give myself six months to get out of agency life. I had already known once I was leaving Cap C that I needed to, to shift out of agency world. I wanted to have a more stable uh, family life. I wanted to start a family and I wanted to shift what was important to me and how I was going to use my time. And so I gave myself six months to leave agency world. And it was so tempting to go back because there's always jobs in, uh, on the agency side, right? There's always somebody looking. There's always somebody who's just being a client. And I said, no, I'm not going to, to do that. And six months to the day, I received confirmation that I had my first job in education at George Brown. And I had been, at that point, I had been actively making connections at the colleges and universities in Toronto, trying to make a shift. I knew I wanted to get into education. I never thought I'd be teaching, but I knew that education was where I needed to be. I needed to be in that industry because if I was going to be marketing or advertising, I wanted to be, I wanted to be more purposeful than just products. So part of your journey into becoming a professor was enrolling in Central Michigan University and doing your master's of education. So why that university and why do your MED? Okay, so when I got to George Brown, I started as the publishing manager there, replacing somebody who was on secondment. And in my role as production manager, I was responsible for the brand guidelines, the website, developing an app and a variety of uh, print materials, so on and so forth. And that job led me into another contract, managing the Department for e-learning and teaching innovation, where I oversaw faculty and support staff. Um, and they delivered a few different things. One, we managed some computer labs, we did some training for students, we did training for faculty, and we also developed online courses. I loved that job. Oh my gosh, I was so immersed in it. I was learning a ton about learning how do people learn? Uh, what are the different approaches? How do we translate that to the online environment? And I applied for the, the director job for that department because it had been vacant ever since I'd taken over, uh, come into my role. And I was passed up on an interview and I was told by HR that I was being passed up for an interview for the director position because I didn't have a graduate level uh, credential. Literally the day after I signed up at Central Michigan 
And I chose Central Michigan University because I had already become aware of Central Michigan through the college system. Many of the Ontario colleges have a relationship with Central Michigan because they offer a, a Master's of Arts in Education with a focus on uh, colleges. And so I already had heard of them. I knew that they were accepted within the college environment. And so I investigated it, but I didn't want to focus on community college just in case if I end up getting a job at university, I didn't want to have the college focus. So I shifted my focus towards curriculum development and instruction. And so I went, it took me, I don't know, probably a year and a half to get my master's there. And then I was like, okay, good, I've got my credentials. So if another director level job comes up, I can apply for it and I have the right credential for it. And I left that area and I moved into managing IT. And it was in IT where I was able to start to explore the relationship between technology, learning and the classroom environment, the live in-person classroom environment. My manager there was outstanding and he let me start teaching part-time. So I had my full-time job, but then he let me uh, teach one course on the side, just so I could see how the technology would have worked. Like how are students actually using their computers? How are, uh, how are teachers using those electronic whiteboards? So on and so forth. One day we went and we explored chairs and we went to a facility that designed chairs and we looked at how the chair impacts learning and how it impacts the learning environment and how faculty could orchestrate a different kind of learning uh, just by simply changing the chairs or how they're configured. And I was like, all these fireworks are exploding in my mind saying, okay, everything is coming together now um, in terms of my interests. Like the technology piece, technology piece really excites me that learning about learning and how people learn really excites me. And I can talk about marketing. That's what I taught actually, uh, an intro level marketing course. And as like all these wor uh, worlds are merging together to you know, probably bring me to the most excited I've ever been uh, in my career ever since leaving university. And so I was like, oh, I gotta do something with this. Like, how, do I, how do I get to do more teaching? And that would bring us into the whole next chapter. And th would that be universal design for learning, becoming a coach and consultant within that kind of framework? So my last job as an administrator at the college was a project coordinator position, managing universal design for learning pilot project. And that's when I learned about this approach to teaching and learning that I practice and coach on today. And as soon as I did that too, I was like, oh my gosh, here's another layer that totally makes sense to how I go about teaching in the classroom and how I think about students and my relationship to students. And that was the thing, that was the final uh, activity, I guess you could say, that made me rip the bandaid off. I left that job and I went to part-time teaching at Centennial College and George Brown. I taught a few courses at both institutions, which is very normal in the, the higher ed world. And while I was doing that, I was ramping up my skills for UDL and then also sharing those skills with new faculty. So this was about five, six, seven years ago. And UDL was relatively unknown and people were just sort of catching on to its benefits. It's still in its infancy across higher ed, uh, across the, I'd say across the country, but where it's not unheard of is in marketing. And this is the kicker. So universal design, right? We are trying to connect with the most number of students and empower them to make the choices that make sense to them. If you put a take a brand approach to it, think about going up to the Tropicana cooler in a grocery store. Tropicana doesn't just sell one type of orange juice. They say, well, we know you want 
orange juice, but maybe you want orange juice with more pulp or less pulp, or you need uh, less calories or less sugar, or you need, you know, orange juice plus uh, vitamin C. So the destination or the final outcome is I need some orange juice, but you're empowering the consumer to make the right choice for them that fulfills greater need. And that's what UDL is doing. It's saying, come here, I'm gonna take you to this destination of learning. And there's gonna be multiple routes to that learning. You can watch it, you can read about it, you can practice it. And then once you're there, tell me about it. Tell me about it in ways that you're confident in. A presentation, writing a missive, telling a story, so on and so forth. So for me, as soon as I heard about UDL and I linked it to marketing, it totally made sense. I'm like, my world are uh, converging here and I can talk to people about this and I can talk to people about it in a way that makes sense. And that's really tangible. How did UDL inform the way you taught over the pandemic? Because everything had become virtual. Did you find that it was having that in your back pocket or being able to strategize with UDL made it easier for, to con- for you to connect with your students in a way you couldn't because there was no classroom work? Or did you find that there were some things that you couldn't use in your toolbox because there was no opportunity to meet with them in the classroom? I will say I am more biased to the classroom environment. I want to see people in person. Oh, don't call it a bias. Let's call it a must. Every time I lecture, I'm saying to students, I'm like, get into the classroom. I'm like, you're never going to, you're never going to develop those soft skills. You've got to learn to problem solve with people right there on the spot. You can't hide behind a video or turn your camera off. If someone says something that you dislike or disagree with, believe me, there are a lot of soft skills that are going away. And I fear for those students that had to spend a majority, if not all of their post-secondary education or any form of education, doing it through a Zoom call. So the UDL... Uh, approach when we apply to online one of the things I would say is okay turn on your your camera if you want to or turn on your mic or if you can't communicate with either of those then communicate in the text right so whichever way you feel comfortable now my ultimate goal was to gravitate as many people to the full experience meaning I want to see them text I want to see their faces and I want to hear their voice but for some, that's not going to be the case. So I don't want the medium to get in the way of them participating. So I want to give them choice. So it's not a all or nothing. If you don't feel comfortable with your camera on, then I want to see, my expectation is you're going to use the chat function a lot. So in an average class of mine, I might have, I know over two hours, probably 200 to 400 posts in the discussion. Now I might only have six to eight people with their cameras and mics on, but I'm trying to empower the learners because being online is very different. Another UDL approach would say, I could record it and you could watch it afterwards because I already acknowledge that you are working part-time or not, if not full-time. And uh, the time of day of my, my live class doesn't really work with your schedule or maybe you're sick or what have you. So again, giving people some options to engage with me. The other thing I would do a lot, a lot of my courses are project-based and we use teams in my courses. And to sort of change their perception about the role of a professor, I would create groups for them, sort of like WhatsApp groups, but in teams, you know, like the private channels for each group where I could see their conversations happening in real time. I could go in and participate. I could say, hey, I see you're on a, on a video chat right now. Good luck with it. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, send me your rough draft so I can take a quick peek at it and give you some feedback. So I'm trying to change their perception of me being just this person who sees stuff at the end to somebody who is going to learn with them, coach with them as they go, rather than it being sort of like this high stakes. So I'm going to submit my midterm assignment, uh, you know, week seven or something like that, and have had no opportunities for iteration. So UDL has taught me that, like, how do I 
empower the student? How do I give them some choices? How do I stack on or layer their learning rather than it just being this all at the end kind of thing? So you can do a lot of these techniques, even though you're online. I think the biggest barrier for me or what I perceive to be the biggest barrier are distractions. And that's the one thing, that's the only benefit of a classroom. With those walls, people can't necessarily cook dinner. They're not going to the bathroom. True story, somebody was on the bathroom when I was talking to them during class. Um, they're not looking for work, so on and so forth. So at home, they just have you know parents asking them questions, um, siblings asking them for things, friends asking them for things, friends on the call with you, just watching you. Um, in a classroom, you can still be present, but not mindfully present. You know, I could be in a classroom, just like if we're in a meeting, I could be in a meeting and my mind could be on my family, uh, paying my mortgage off, anything, right? But those walls, they do really stop a lot of those distractions from coming in. So you have a fighting chance. And I agree with you, when you have that fighting chance, you can shift your focus to the things that really matter most, which are, which is those soft skills. Like talk to your colleague that's beside you, introduce yourself. Let's work on something together so that we can build up strength in each other and support each other and make a community of learning versus an isolated learning experience. It makes it way more fun. It makes it way more interesting and it helps the time pass. And that's what I'm there for. I, I want to create an engaging, sometimes intense, my students say I'm intense, that's fine, um, <laughs> an intense kind of work environment. Like, I want you to show up and let's do some stuff. Let's just not listen to me lecture. I don't do a whole lot of that. But let's do some practical applications of the material that we need to, to review. And that, you just, you, you just don't get that online. You mentioned the different ways or the different options students have to be graded at, say, at the end of the semester, outside of, say, a formal final exam where you're just writing in a notebook or completing a multiple choice, a yeah. multiple choice exam. Is there a technique that's that really stands out that's most popular, most effective? And is there a technique that surprised you where you hadn't thought about it under UDL or what you'd been trained on and a student brought it forward to you and said, I'd like to be graded this way? Is that an option? I'll tell you about my favorite course. Maybe this will help me answer this. My favorite course is a digital marketing uh, course. It's the last course that students will take in the three-year program. And they get to choose what they want to learn, how they will learn it, and how they will demonstrate their learning. So the intention behind this is that all of the schools Universities and colleges are cranking out marketing grads, but some of the marketing grads have no idea what they want to do. Is it in media? Is it advertising? Is it sales? Is it email? What have you? And I think that does them a little bit of a disservice because when they start looking for work, they have, they're not focused. And so when I designed this course, I said, I'm going to help them figure themselves out a little bit more and really help them to identify what matters to them. And so that when they do go to apply for a job, they can show a project that nobody else has done and that supports the industry that they want to go into. For example, one student of mine wanted to create a blog that was focused on uh, the finance industry or financial content. And so she had to learn how to write a blog, all the best practices. She had to set up the blog, write all the articles, make sure they, they were SEO optimized, had all those inbound links, uh, outbound links, so on and so forth, met all the best practices. And then she had to share that uh, publicly through LinkedIn. And so by doing so, she was able to then link to it when she was applying for jobs. So she, she knew she wanted to work for the big banks. And so when she applies, she could say, hey, these are the blogs that I've been writing about in terms of um, marketing practices, marketing trends in the financial industry. Check it out. 
So it shows what she's interested in. She could talk very authentically to building out this content and why whatever she talked about was important to her. She can talk about what those marketing trends are so that she's up on the latest um, information for her interview. Like to me, those are all check marks. And so that's the, that's the course that excites me the most because I'm going to receive 50 different everythings, 50 different proposals, 50 different projects at the end of the course. And I'll tell you, the students at first, they always tell me like they were really uncertain. They didn't know how much work was going to be involved in, in developing whatever they wanted to develop. But at the end, the music to my ears are sentences like, I was learning for me. I was meeting my own expectations. That's what we want students to do when they leave. When you hire a student in marketing advertising, you want somebody who's curious about something, right? Who's asking questions, um, who will bring their creativity to the shop saying, you know, I'm curious about this, so I'm going to develop that. I'm going to try this tool out. And if it doesn't work, great. I'm going to try a different tool. And if that tool doesn't work, I'm going to go find another one. And you want somebody who's unique, who's got something to say, who has a perspective, right? Who can think critically about what they're going through. And so that's what that course is all about. So that's the one, like, even for me right now, just talking about it, thinking, oh my gosh, I can't wait for the fall because in this fall, coming up fall 2023 will be the first time that I will teach this course in person. And I'm just so pumped to do it because it's sort of like all the, the light bulbs turn on for these students and they say, oh, this is what I want to do. Or like last semester, I had a student that says, I'm not sure this is the industry for me. And I was like, okay, so why is that? Let's reflect on that. What part of this project gave you energy? What part of this project didn't give you energy? Are we you know, throwing out the whole industry as a whole, or can we recenter you somehow? Um, like those are all the really powerful introspective kind of things that I think students really need to leave here with so that they are good employees in our industry. Like AI is changing our industry, but we still need leaders, managers, uh, coordinators, what have you, that are curious, creative, and unique and who will think on the spot, think critically, and do things that give them energy so that that pours into really great work. Danny, this has been a fantastic chat. Are you ready for rapid fire questions? Sure. The most meaningful campaign you worked on? Without a doubt, the most meaningful campaign was Newfoundland Labrador's tourism campaign. I think coming from Toronto, moving to Newfoundland Labrador, being thrown into the culture, the people, the place, and what made it unique, it just connected with, with my soul. And it was such a welcoming brand to work on. And I take the learnings from them everywhere I go. Your favorite movie? Dead Poet Society. You know, the teacher and me <laughs> at the end when Professor Kitty's leaving the classroom and they all get on their desks and say, Captain, my captain. And he was teaching them to look at uh, things from different perspectives. Ah, love that movie. Your favorite book? A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. The reason why that connects with me so much is because it's, he talks a lot about the role of the ego. And teaching has been historically a very ego-driven um, profession. You know, I'm the sage on the stage. I know everything. I will impart my knowledge to you and you will regurgitate it back to me. And when we start looking at our ego and placing it to the side and we say, hey, students, you have control. You have the power. You make the decisions. I'm here just to help you. And you take your ego out of it and then it, it removes power unbalances in the classroom. It gets them more excited. Oh, so good. A new earth. Your favorite song? When Love Takes Over by Kelly Rowland. Uh, ultimate pride song for sure. Um, always pumps me up. I think it's got a great message. It's got great beat. Something that totally gets me pumped up before class. The best advice you have ever received? I'll, I'll drop two on that one. So the first one is keep showing up. My stepdad says this all the time. Keep showing up. 
you know, you can be bruised, you can be off kilter, but you just got to keep showing up. There's so much to see, do, and try in our industry. And so many opportunities that if you keep showing up, you will keep growing, you will keep learning, you will meet a whole host of fun people and do some things that you've never thought possible. The other one is don't let perfection get in the way of pretty darn good. Anytime I hear students are talking about being perfectionists, uh, I'm saying, you know, take a load off. You don't have to be perfect. Strive for your best. What's the saying? Somebody else said it, but uh, do your best, forget the rest. But for me, it's like, I want you to do the best you can. Let's focus on that first before we have to worry about perfection. My signature closing question, if you weren't in media, what would you be doing and why? I'm doing it. <laughs> so uh, I am, ever since I was nine, like I said, uh, ever since I was nine, I wanted to be a teacher. And when I didn't get into Con Ed, I sort of parked that dream of mine. And it took me on a 20 year path, a different route, just a different route to get to the same destination. Um, as a teacher now, I work the most I've ever worked. I am more creatively drained than I've ever been, but I am the happiest I have ever been. Um, being a teacher, teaching a, an industry of discipline that I absolutely adore and looking at these students who are just ready to learn and nothing is more fulfilling than that. Danny, this has been a fantastic chat. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. That's it for today's show. For more episodes, you can go to mediapeople.ca, your favorite podcast platform, or youtube.com slash at mediapeoplepodcast. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Vic Genova.